verses 17 through 19. We'll finish out the chapter uh, this evening. Uh, and so we'll begin at verse 20. But just to kind of um, review where we were last week and, and kind of get the flow of the context here. Jesus said in um, verse 18, he prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And so we, um, we looked at the idea here of sanctification. And we examined that in light of the work of Jesus and how he had been sanctified. And we said that that, that speaks of being set apart or made, um, uh, made, uh, made pure is, is, is another uh, way that, that it's, that it's uh, translated. And, and, and that kind of speaks to another aspect of the work of sanctification. But... Um, we know that Jesus uh, sanctified himself here, verse 19. He set himself apart, and that was for um, his disciples, uh, that they also might be sanctified uh, through the truth. And now in verse 20, um, why, why don't I read 20 through 26, and just to get the the flow, and then we'll look at each verse. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast, hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, and the, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. There's a lot there. Sometimes, I don't know about you, when I, but when I read through this, um, I get a little tongue-tied and, and uh, a little jumbled. Um, but, and, and so you got to kind of take it phrase by phrase, piece by piece, and think through it. But in verse 20 here, where we're beginning tonight, Christ pivots in the object of his prayer. Okay, you remember he began, um, he began his prayer, verses 1 through 5, and he was asking the Father for his own needs, right? He asked the Father to glorify him. Um, verses 6 now through 19, we see Christ praying for who he calls those who thou hast given me. Okay, The context seems to indicate that he's speaking specifically about his disciples. And as we, have, as we, um, as we discussed the first week that we jumped into this chapter, Christ here is with his disciples. Um, uh, as he's praying. And so it, 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 it seems that he's praying right there in their, in their presence. And so he's, he's praying specifically in verses 6 through 19 for his disciples. We saw the various requests that he made of the Father on behalf of his disciples. And now in verse 20, Christ pivots in the object of his prayer to those who would be reached through his disciples. Notice how he says this, neither pray I for these alone, his disciples, but for them also 
which shall believe on me through their word, through the disciples' word, right? He had sent them out two by two. We know that following his death and resurrection, just before his ascension, he recommissions them to send them out into the whole world to preach the gospel. And so now he prays for those who would be who, who preached through um, what he says, uh, through their word, or in other words, through their witness. So this part of his prayer, uh, we, we definitely can see in expectant faith that the Father's will would be accomplished, right? Because he's praying for those who, um, who have not yet believed on him, but would believe. faith that the Father's will would be accomplished. And we know that the Father's will was that Christ's death would provide for all the world the eternal life and the forgiveness that they needed. And so he prays, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which believe on me through their word. Was he prayed for them? Well, um, let's take verses 21 through 23 here and look at this section. He prays that they all may be one. Now we know that he had um, he had referenced that same thought and that same desire um, towards his disciples. But now he prays it for um, for those who his disciples would reach with the gospel that they all may be one. So the specific request here is, um, is a unity. And, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, instead of using the word unity tonight, I'm going to use the word oneness. Um, his request here for them is oneness. He says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. And so he reference, references here his oneness with the Father. Um, I think it was in John chapter 5. He told the Pharisees, I and my Father are one. And so uh, his prayer was that the Father would unite them, would make them one in relation to him and the Father. He says, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And so he is, um, his desire, his purpose um, is to bring the Father, the Son, and all of the followers together in oneness. He says that they also may be one in us. The world may believe that has sent me. They needed to be united in purpose and in power. Okay? When you, when you see Christ's words there, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, we see that oneness and purpose and power that was, uh, that was true of that relationship between the Father and and the Son. They were one in purpose. They were one in power. The quality of oneness that Christ is praying for these is that same quality that the Father and, and the Son had, right? As thou, he said, Father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And so he's praying for that same quality of oneness between him and the Father and these followers. Christ, was in lock, Christ himself was in lockstep with the will of the Father through complete submission to the Father's will. He was in full reception of the authority and power of the Father through complete obedience. 
this quality of oneness that he had with the Father was what was therefore essential for the cycle of ministry to continue in and through these that he's praying for. Okay. Christ was uh, one with the father in the father's will because he completely submitted himself to the father's will. He was, he, he had fully received all the authority and power of the father because he was completely obedient to the Father. And he knew that that had to be the same in those who would continue uh, the work here on earth. And so that's why he's praying for oneness. He's praying that they, like him, would be one with the Father, that they would be in lockstep with the Father's will, and that they would receive all authority and power that the Father wanted to give them. And so that's what he's praying for here, this oneness. Um, the purpose of oneness was to bring the world to faith in Christ as the Son of God and the way to God. Notice how he says it at the end of verse 21. Why was he praying they all may be one? that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so we see the requirement here for this message to be received in faith. It had to come through a, uh, through a, uh, a, a relationship of oneness with the Father and the Son. Their oneness with Christ and with the Father would be the mark of, of Christ's uh, messiahship and deity. Notice what he says again, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Okay, They were going to go out and they were going to preach that Jesus was who? The Messiah, the anointed one, the one foretold by the prophets, the one that God had promised of old, Christ was was he and so in order for 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 the hearers to believe the message there needed to be a oneness between the sender right the father and the messenger disciple of christ and this is why they were not to be taken from the world but to remain in the world it was for the work of the Father. And this oneness with the Father and the Son was, was what was going to um, was what was going to make their ministry work. We see in verse 22, the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So to this end. For this purpose, that the world may believe that, 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 that thou hast sent me, um, Christ gave them, he says, the glory that God had given him. What do you mean by that? Well, the Father sent the Son, right? And he gave him all of the represent uh, all of the divine representation credentials that he needed to prove who he was, to prove that he was sent from God. And that was Christ's message to the people. I am sent of God, right? Remember at the, at the baptism of Jesus, uh, the voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the message of Jesus was, I am the Son of God. And so to that end, Christ gave his people, those who would be proclaiming his message, the glory, he says, that God had given him. In other words, he was equipping them with the same divine credentials that the Father had provided him. And we see 
the effect of that. We see the glory of God given by Jesus to his disciples, and it is seen by those to whom they preached the gospel, right? Um, the day of Pentecost. Um, there's that passage in Acts chapter 4 where um, they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. And so the glory of God that was given to Christ, Christ says, I have given to them. Why? That they may be one even as we are one. He sums up the vision of his prayer now in verse 23. As he's praying, he has in his heart and mind a vision, a picture, an image of, uh, 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 of what, needs to, uh, what needs to happen uh, to fulfill the Father's plan. And he sums it up here in verse 23 where he says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And so do you see the, do you see the, the I guess you could say the chain of authority, father, son, believer. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And so Christ here sums up this uh, prayer for oneness. In this oneness, in three components, forms the completeness of the Father's plan. Father, Son, and Child, right? I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect or complete in one. And so as they followed the Father through the example of Christ and as was given to them the authority and the power of God, they were walking in completeness of oneness. He says in verse 23, that in that the world uh, this oneness was that they might be complete, uh, be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And so this oneness of these who would believe with Christ and in Christ with the Father would express the plan of God as well as the love of God. The world would know that thou hast sent me and that the Father has loved them as thou hast. Oneness really was a testimony to the world of who God is, who Christ was, and that mankind can be reconciled uh, to God in this way. Now, verses 24 through 26, he says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Christ's ultimate desire is for his followers to experience the full glory of God in him, where? In eternity. In John 14, in verse 1, Jesus told his disciples uh, to let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. See that expectation that they would be with him 
Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And now he expresses that same thought, that same desire to the Father. I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Why? That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. So with the, with the beholding of the full glory of God in Christ comes a full knowledge of God as he desires mankind to know him. Our existence here is or ought to be one of growing in knowledge of God our Father. But when we reach eternity, when we are, as Christ says, as Christ desires, with him where he is, in beholding his glory, which the Father had given him, then we will know completely. Then we will know fully the Father. He says, for thou, lo for thou lovest me before the foundation of of the world. The glory of God in Christ, given before the foundation of the world, lies in the Father's love for his Son. And that 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 moment when we are with him, beholding him in full glory in eternity, we will see in full the Father's love. For his son. He closes the prayer in verses 25 and 26. He says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. Why is that? Because the Father is righteous. And the world is unrighteous. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. Here he testifies to the void in the world of a knowledge of who God is. There's a void there. They are blind to who God is. But Christ says, I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. So he testifies to his witness to who the Father is. His knowledge of the Father leads then to their knowledge of the Father, his, his disciples. And then the end result of Christ's revelation of the knowledge of the Father is that the love of the Father manifested in them, is manifested in them as it was in Christ himself. Notice how he says it in verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. Why? That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. And so he, there's a lot of truth here, and uh, we could definitely spend more time on this, but I wanted to tie a couple of thoughts back um, to uh, John chapter 14, verse, beginning at verse 7, if Jesus testified to his disciples, if ye had known me, ye should have ye should have known my father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Peter saith unto, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father and it, and, and it suffices us. In other words, we'll be satisfied. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the father. And how sayest thou then, show us the father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In verse 20, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that keepeth, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. 
And then one more um, passage, John 15, verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So, what we see in these verses and what we've seen in Jesus' prayer here in John 17 is that for the believer, Jesus is the joiner or the connector between man and God. And in the believer's life, in the ministry that he is to carry out, Jesus is the one who spans the gap, so to speak. We are in him, he is in the Father, and Christ's desire and his purpose was that what came from the Father to him would then be passed from him to his followers to, to, to continue to accomplish the work of the Father. The prayer here in John 17 um, is, is rich uh, with truth, but we've seen uh, a, couple of, a, a couple of things that, that really um, form some real principles for how we ought to pray to the Father. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, throughout his prayer here, acknowledged what the Father had done, what the Father had said. He was standing upon, he was claiming what God had said. He was claiming the promises uh, of God. And you and I, in our prayers, must do the same. We must know what God has said, and we must know what God's plan is, and we must pray in complete correlation or coordination with what God said, with what he's promised, with what his plan is. The uh, Lord Jesus also, as we see in this prayer, was praying or expressing complete dependence upon the Father. Uh, th there was uh, there there was no dependence upon himself, but he prayed in complete dependence on the Father, and uh, that's how you and I must pray as well. Otherwise, what's the point of praying? If we're praying to the Father while depending upon ourselves, we're wasting our breath. And we're really making a mockery of, uh, of prayer. Our prayers must be completely dependent on the Father. And the third thing that we see in Christ's prayer is that Christ was praying in complete submission to the Father's will. Uh, he was completely uh, yielded to what the Father wanted to do to, to what the father's plan was and he prayed for himself he prayed for his disciples he prayed for those who his disciples would reach all the time with the father's will in mind with what the father wanted to accomplish for his glory and so we see some wonderful truths we could we could definitely um, pull more out of here. Um, but I trust that our study here, I think we took six weeks uh, to go through this chapter, and uh, it's been encouraging and enlightening to me. I trust it has for you. Um, but uh, Lord Jesus was uh, a master prayer. Um, he was... Um, He was simple in his prayer. It wasn't complicated. Um, he was uh, focused in his prayer. Uh, he had laser focus on the Father's will. And that's what it has to be with you and with me as well. 
Lord, we ask you to, uh, Lord, to continue to teach us, to train us to pray. And Father, I, I ask, Lord, that we would take heed to the, um, the method, uh, we could say, the manner in which Christ prayed. And Lord, that we would approach your throne in much the same way. Lord, I pray that you would help us to set aside uh, our own will and desire and help us to pray according to your will. Lord, help us to pray according to your promises. Lord, we can't pray in confidence without knowing, Lord, what you've said and claiming that to be true, to be right, and to be just. And so we pray, Lord, that you would Lord, strengthen us in these areas and that we might, as a result, see you do great things in us, through us. And we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.